the very beginning, he always held his head to the left, and he held his head up high, and most small children, infants, don't do that. So that was the beginning of, do we have a problem here? And he didn't have a lot of strength in his right leg and in his right hand. He had his hand clenched most of the time, but most babies do, so you don't really know. We went in to see Dr. Carnet, and he had a CAT scan in his office which was really unheard of at that time. But he said, look, I've got it here. He tests out normal when I'm testing him, you know, the visual, but let's do a CAT scan. And two hours later, he had us in his office, and he said, this is a picture of your son's brain, and I'm sorry to tell you that he had a stroke, and it probably occurred at birth. And there was a big black spot on the left hemisphere of his brain. He said, um, all I can tell you is take him home and, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. Chances are he will experience seizures. And, of course, that was devastating. I was having a great deal of trouble with it. I thought, oh, my goodness, is he going to read? Is he going to write? Is he going to go to school? You know, how, is he going to walk? Is he going to talk? Because nobody really had any answers. What does it mean to be human? From the psychologist's point of view, explaining the human experience begins with an exploration of what it is that makes us human, the brain. The ability to walk and talk, to read and go to school, to perceive the world around us, to remember past experiences, and to feel emotion. These lie at the core of our humanity, and the brain plays a major role in them. But these tasks would be impossible without the body's primary communication network, the nervous system. The nervous system is divided into two main parts, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain and spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is made up of all the nerves outside the brain and spinal cord. Biological psychologists have long been interested in how the nervous system processes the information it receives, and more importantly, how this information affects our behavior. With such an important role to play in our well-being, what would happen if a key part of the nervous system, the brain, were damaged beyond repair? Guy Gavilich was about to find out. At 10 months, Guy started having seizures. And initially, they were staring spells. And you, you, know, you couldn't get him to come back. Um, you could wave your hand in front of him, and he just was... He just didn't see you. And he had every medication that was possible. He became a study. After Dr. Carnet went through all of the combinations of drugs and none of them really worked, um, what they did was really take away the life out of him. I mean, eventually he would lay on a pillow and he was drugged. And it was a terrible experience to see, you know, what you did to a small child. When I walked into UCLA to see Dr. Shields, and he stood in front of me when Guy was two and a half years old, and he said, well, we have this new surgery that we can do where they remove half the brain. And I was like, you have got to be joking. Remove half of my child's brain. There's abs I'm sorry, there's no way we can't even discuss that. What in the world makes you think that you can make somebody better by taking out half of their brain? Uh, when you have a problem like he had with severe seizures, those seizures were interfering with the other part of his brain. That good right hemisphere could not function normally because of those seizures. The reason that we do the surgery is not just to stop the seizures, but to give that child the chance to have a more normal developmental process. I think he was on his way to being institutionalized by this time. He wouldn't have been able to function well enough to live at home. He certainly wouldn't have been able to go to school and have a job or do anything that he's able to do now. And so we went home and it was time to decide if we were going to do it or not do it. And I looked over at him one night, I thought he was sleeping, and he got up and he sat up in bed and I know that he thought he was talking to me. Um, by the way he was playing with this doll that he had. I knew he was telling me something about it, but nothing was coming out of his mouth. So I called Dr. Carnet, and he immediately put him on phenobarbital. 
And he said, I think this is, we've got to get this surgery scheduled and you've got to do it now because he thought it was moving over into the right hemisphere. So we did, and October 3rd, 1988, was when Guy had the hemispherectomy. And it was the longest day, but it was truly a gift. 